Okay, so this section talks about the role of ideology. Some things we're going to talk about is, you know, ideology and how it acts as a bridge between the social structures and our culture, what an ideology is, some dominant and competing ideologies, the concept of <clears throat> true and false consciousness, the importance of ideology in social science, and then just kind of a general brief overview of four ideologies within the United States. If you haven't done the reading yet, the four ideologies that they talk about in the book, there's huge sections on it. Um, I'm going to upload PowerPoints for those but they're not going to be discussed in the exam or in the quiz because there's just, it's a lot of material and I don't really think that it's as relevant as some of the other things we're going to talk about. So feel free to skip over that part of the reading or skim it. Um, and then just look at the PowerPoints if, if you'd like, but it's not going to be required. Oh, I forgot to take the animations off again. Okay, so building the bridge between culture and social structures. So our understanding of the structure of our society, whether or not we accept and support it, and our understanding of violence, you know, what it is and what we believe causes it, are all products of the ideologies that we're taught during socialization. A society's dominant ideology is the mechanism that defends, preserves, and legitimate, legitimates the way of life of the people. This includes the structural arrangements and the systems of stratification that form the foundation of our society and the normative systems that support and preserve them. So again, you know, the systems of stratification, this is that hierarchy where some people have more than others. So the ideology is the way of thinking about those that makes us okay with it. It justifies that system so that we go along with it. So what is an ideology? There's a few definitions. Um, Hunt refers to an ideology as the ideas and beliefs that tend to justify morally a society's social and economic relationships. So most members of a society internalize this ideology, the dominant one, and thus believe that their functional roles as well as those of others are morally correct and that the method that the society divides human labor and its pro, uh, its products are is fair. This common belief gives society a cohesiveness and without it, there would be turmoil and revolutions um, if the differences are very broad. So, Generally, an ideology represents a set of ideas and beliefs that reflect a simplified understanding of how the society is ordered. So this is set up this way so that we all function within it. It's moral. Um, it's fair. You know, you, you get what you work for. And this is kind of the, um, the American dream 
this is that this is an ideology where you know what that you get what you give it's justified if you're not getting what you're putting in then the problem is with you it's not with with the system So what decides what somebody's um, ideology is? So each society will have a dominant ideology. And these can change over time. But the dominant ideology will represent the type of society as defined by the mode or, of production or reproduction. Um, we have a capitalist society. Um, the interests of the dominant positions. So this is the class, gender, and ethnic position that is dominant. Um, ours within the United States, this is the upper class, male, white. And if you want to add religion in there, Christian. The historical experience of the society... Um, whether it's a history of conflict and compromise between positions and creating the social order. And then cultural and religious heritage. So the dominant ideology that has been pretty much since the beginning of the finding, founding of the United States has been... Um, Capitalist, white, Christian, male, upper class. Um, so the way we're taught to think about how everything works and why it works that way is from the vantage point of someone in that position. And I... The, this, these dominant ideologies are often contested. Um, there are competing ideologies that ref, uh, will reflect the divisions within the society. And we'll talk about those. <clears throat> There's three central components of an ideology. Um, There's a description, an analysis, and a prescription. So the description is what is the nature of the humans, of the social order. The analysis is the how and why. Why is the society ordered this way? How does it reflect the human nature? Um, is the way that the society is ordered consistent with the nature of the humans? Um, if it's inconsistent with human nature and restricts human potentials, then that could potentially be a problem. The prescription is the evaluation and recommendation. So is it just and fair? Is it the best it can be to maximize um, the positive attributes and potentials of the people within it? Um, what should be done to either change or maintain the order? So ideologies are kind of confusing, but another way of understanding them is that um, ideologies represent the viewpoint based on where you're standing within that structure and within the social order. So if you can imagine the hierarchy of the United States by any, by any method. So if you imagine the the class hierarchy. There's upper, upper class, middle class, lower class, working poor. Where do you fall within that? Honestly, most people think like to think they're middle class. The middle class doesn't really exist anymore. Um, or it's a lot smaller than we like to think it is. So if you draw it out as a diagram, where are you sitting on that? If you're looking at race and ethnic hierarchy that's generally white at the top and then everybody else <laughs> underneath 
Um, where are you standing in that? If we're looking at gender, it's either male, female, or other. Males on the top, females in the middle, others on the bottom. If we're looking at um, what else? But you get the idea. Oh, religions. Um, Christianity is at the top. Um, Catholicism, Judaism are probably second. And then pretty much everything else is underneath that. But the dominant t t ones at the top are Christian and Catholic and then denominations of those. Um, so if you think about it that way, where are you sitting yourself in, in the order of everyone else? And how does where you're sitting affect how you're viewing everything? So why would you have a different viewpoint about the society and society's problems based on where you're sitting? If you are a female, you're more likely to be the victim of interpersonal violence, at least in, if you're looking at you know, male on female violence. That could change your view of the Me Too movement, that can change your view on uh, marriage relations and equality in socioeconomic relations. Um, if you are a minority and you are looking at socioeconomic stuff, you are going to view things differently than a white person if you are being disadvantaged as far as the types of jobs that you're able to get, how you're treated, um, discrimination and stuff like that, you're gonna view those topics differently than somebody who doesn't experience them. So, if you're looking at it this way, We need to be able to v view the same problem from the position of that other person. So you need to be able to remove yourself from where you're sitting in that hierarchy and say, okay, if I were sitting over there, how would this look? Um, true and false consciousness. Um, this is an interesting little concept, and I've attached a really nice little YouTube video um, that goes over false consciousness and is really good explanation. Um, I really wish they would put out more um, sociology stuff like this just to um, just to help. Um, it's actually kind of like a psychological thing, um, and this is when one's ideology doesn't vibe with where they're actually sitting at the table. So whether we're looking at class, gender, or ethnic positions, if you're sitting at the head of the table and you know you're sitting at the head of the table, this is true consciousness. You know exactly where you're at. You know, if you're sitting at you know, all the way at the end in the middle of the table and you think you're sitting at the head of the table, that's a false consciousness. Um, so it's knowing where your place is and acting like you know where your place is. Um, but I suggest reading or watching that video because it's super helpful. I thought it was a really great piece. Um, but false consciousness technically is assuming another person's perspective that does not actually reflect where you're at in the order. Um, there's several reasons why this can occur. The integration and socializing institutions of the society, this is the family, schools, government, religious organizations, media, 
they serve to reinforce and perpetuate the dominant ideology. In any class, gender, or ethnic stratified society, or one run by a ruling elite, for the dominant position to maintain its position of dominance, there must be a great deal of false consciousness within the people. If not, there will be more violence to control those that are in the lower positions. So the people at the top need the people at the bottom to not feel like they're at the bottom. Otherwise, they're going to get mad. They're going to be like, this is unfair. We need to fix this. And that's not what the people at the top want. So they need them to feel that they're not on the bottom. So this is the fish not realizing it's wet kind of idea. So why is it important to know these different ideological perspectives? Um, they're a good starting point when you're looking at research. So you need to begin with uncovering what kind of assumptions people have and then go from there. Um, they're generally implicit, they're buried in theoretical approaches, and they underlie a lot of models of social policy. So these assumptions guide the, the person that's the theorist and the researcher in choosing what to study and how to study it. So if you want to do an investigation into, let's say, violence in schools, and why is there violence in schools? Well, if nobody's noticed, um, the CDC does not keep data on gun violence. And that is because of an ideology that states that it's not the gun that's the problem, it's the person. So they don't do, they don't collect data on gun violence because it's not the gun's problem, it's the person's problem. So that right there is a really good example of how your ideology or the other person's ideology reflects what they're choosing to research and how they're choosing to research it. That's just an example. Um, ideologies underlie all major schools of thought in addressing all areas of social problems. So everybody's got an explanation for everything. You just need to figure out what the ideology is behind it. Um, the presentation of these perspectives allows you to realize and assess the assumptions that underlie your own ideas. Um, if you go in with assumptions, you need to know what they are and you need to try to account for those so that you don't skew your data. The ideologies presented are general descriptions. Um, there will be branches within each one that are not general, eh, necessarily going to be detailed. Just know that it's not all very black and white, cut and dried. There's always differences when you look at certain subgroups or certain people within these groups. Okay, so four contemporary ideologies that are in the book. Like I said, you can skim over these if you want. You can read this uh, separate PowerPoints for these, but they're not going to be on the exam. Um, these ideologies are in most public policy debates, including issues related to violence. So there is two types of conservatives and two types of liberals. There's organic and classical conservatives and there are individualist and classical liberals. Whoops. Where did I go here? Oh, sorry. Um,
and then there is the uh, socialists. These are the social democrats, the socialists, radical, socialist, feminists. Um, all of these are, like I said, I'm going to put a completely separate PowerPoint that goes into way too much detail about how all of these work. Um, you're welcome to look at them. Um, you're welcome to use them if you want in any of your case study stuff. Just know that on the exam, I'm not going to ask you details about them. I would prefer you just know about the hierarchies and how they reflect ideology and the components of ideology and stuff like that, um, rather than knowing the specific ideologies. Um, they're always changing. Um, and it just seems like a, it's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of stuff that we're not necessarily going to use. So thank you guys for your time and I will get this posted. Thanks.